I give you Darren with good sir. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be among you today, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, and given the illustrious list of uh, participants here today, there's absolutely no way that I'm not going to offend at least one of you. Um, it's a very broad uh, cross-section of the community and wonderfully so. Firstly, my apologies for not being able to be with you last Thursday, but I do think I had a reasonable excuse. His Honour, Justice Richard White required me in the, uh, in the witness box just up the road here at the Federal Court. Um, but thank you for uh, being patient enough to call me back again today. Uh, thank you to Affinity as well. I've had a long uh, gish, uh, long ish uh, relationship uh, with them. Uh, I admire and respect the work that they do and the promotion of uh, interfaith and intercultural activities. And it's something that the Sydney Morning Herald takes um, you know, very seriously and uh, seeks to promote uh, understanding and mutual respect across a, you know, a range of uh, areas. So, and also, thank you not for the uh, incredibly taxing subject matter for today's uh, speech, ethical decision making and social <laughs> responsibility. We could spend a week on this because um, it's such a, a vast and multi-layered um, topic. And I'll try and do a little bit of justice to, uh, to this subject matter and our perspective, but obviously hope to uh, encourage some questions uh, afterwards on particular areas that you want to open up and I'm uh, very much uh, happy to, uh, to talk about. Uh, I just thought I'd start off by saying that next year uh, the Sydney Morning Herald celebrates 185 years as a newspaper publisher and that is a, an incredibly significant milestone in its own right but particularly when you consider that that makes us one of the oldest continually publishing mastheads in the entire, in the entire world. Um, it's an incredible, at least in the English speaking world, um, it's an incredible achievement and one um, you know, which we uh, obviously are very humbled by. But equally impressively, um, this year, actually next month, marks the, um, and I'm gonna take my glasses off because I can't actually read my speaking notes at the moment. <laughs> I'll blame the computers at work on that. Um, it's our 20th anniversary as an internet publisher. April. And in fact, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we decided that Anzac Day um, 1995 would be a really good day to uh, launch ourselves into the world of the internet. Now, despite the fact that it's ubiquitous uh, these days, in 1995, I'm proud to say that the Herald was at the very the forefront of this technology and again, uh, marked ourselves as one of the true pioneers when it came to this uh, then nascent uh, sort of publishing uh, model. Uh, for instance, we very much were ahead of the New York Times and other <coughs> comparable media organisations. Um, but it's, and the other thing about the, the internet is it's really put us in touch with really rapidly changing audience needs and demands. And when we come to this issue of ethical decision making and social responsibility, it magnifies by a thousand fold the sort of burdens of responsibility that were weighing on the shoulders of my predecessors, all of whom had very, very serious jobs in their, in their own right, but only restricted to the newspaper. Um, so it's, I would submit it's these journalistic traits, our experience and our dedication to heritage values of fairness, independence and accuracy that's been founded in our print era, era combined with the fast-paced nature of digital storytelling uh, that we hope this keeps us connected to our audience. Um, and despite the constantly changing ways our audience can view or read us, and that's another big change that's occurred and is occurring, our journalism, in our journalism, I would hope that there's a quality assurance, um, a benchmark that underpins everything we do. And despite lots of things that I want to change and will continue to change, that is something that cannot alter at the Sydney Morning Herald. So it, it matters little if 
you're a political correspondent or an editor, an entertainment writer, a photographer. Uh, the work we aspire to at the Herald is identical in one respect, and that is that we strive to be fair and balanced in everything that we do. That we are committed to fearless and honest storytelling, and that is the guiding principle to everything we do, and hopefully something that we feel that sets us apart from our many competitors uh, that are growing by the day in the, in the internet era. These values are core to our brand, honest and accountable journalism. Everyone who works for the Herald, however, is encouraged to express their views and opinions. I don't want you to think that the newsroom is a docile place at all. It's a highly uh, uh, competitive and edgy environment where the best ideas compete for your attention on a daily basis. And this reflects, I hope, the varying interests of all of you, the community that we are proud to serve. Um, but it's also this freedom, I hope, that propels you know, an ever-moving feast of ideas and hopefully fosters great creativity and energy. Um, I mean, when Peter uh, rather wonderfully rolled out my career, which uh, made me feel quite ancient, um, because it was 30 years ago last month that I started straight from high school in this, in this business, it remains, for me, the most stimulating and exciting of, of any workplace and uh, one that I'm keen to continue in. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that we are not only the oldest um, continually published masthead in Australia, but we also have the biggest audience. And um, so when you combine our print readership with our digital readership, we touch uh, five or so million people each month read or view our journalism. So it's a wonderful thing. We're very proud of that, but we're also very humbled by that. And also for me as editor-in-chief, um, also a little bit daunted by the burden of responsibility that comes with that, with that task. Being such a significant player in the community, uh, I want, if there's nothing else that you leave this room with today, I want you to be assured that everyone from me down to the most junior reporter takes that responsibility uh, very seriously. The other thing I think was important to say is that despite new ways of communicating, our willingness to change and our eagerness to respond to uh, fast moving audience demands um, continues. But it remains fixed to, um, to our foundations, to our heritage. There's no use moving to expand new audiences unless you firmly identify with what is your purpose and founding identity to begin with. And each day I'm reminded of this by a massive mural that is displayed in the entry foyer to the editorial floor. Uh, and it was the, uh, the charter established by our forebears in April of 1831. And it says, our editorial management shall be conducted upon principles of candour, honesty and honour. There wasn't much of that back in 1831, by the way. <laughs> we have no wish to mislead, no interest to gratify by unsparing abuse or indiscriminate approbation. It's a more a noble way, perhaps, of explaining the independent, always, uh, moniker that is now above our, our masthead. But it's these principles that guide us in all that we do and I'm often struck by how, how um, relevant, deeply relevant that phrase was that was uh, depicted for us you know, nearly 185 years ago. I'm just getting on to independent always. It was cottoned on a few years ago in the face of a broader competitive landscape. We now have uh, the Guardian, Mail Online, and the BBC has set up an Australian shingle. Uh, we're soon to partner with a, uh, an internet giant in the United States, the Huffington Post. It's a very, very 
competitive landscape, and I haven't mentioned our main rival, which is, is News Corporation. And at the time they were having, and I was born and bred there, <coughs> as uh, Peter pointed out, um, and have had many of my formative years there. Um, but they were having their difficulties at the time, and so uh, the, some of them had succumbed to inappropriate influences in their editorial coverage, to say the least. So we determined to place the words independent always as a distinguishing feature, an extension, as I said, of our original masthead calling, emphasising that our compact was with our readers and only with our readers. And that's easier said than done, when I'll, um, which I'll get to in, a, in effect. Again, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is that we take our responsibilities very seriously. Uh, there's an incredible burden placed upon us and upon me. Uh, it's a, a compact of trust with our, with our readers. Um, and we all believe that we have an incredibly privileged position because we've only got one thing going for us and that is that compact of trust, that masthead. That is our value proposition. That is what makes people buy our journalism to fund, to fund what we do, and we lose that at our peril. We can and do influence change. We can and do impose restrictions on individuals and organisations. We make people and organisations and businesses feel uncomfortable and incredibly so at times. We intrude on people's privacy but in all that we do we're guided by our need to be fair and balanced in all that we do. We offend people sometimes but when we do I would like to think that we do so uh, in a way that considers all of the interests involved. Um, and as editor, um, organisations, individuals, uh, meetings, all of these things, are, including today, I, I seek to do in a, better, in a way to better understand things that are going on in, in the community um, and the people that we serve. And all of my senior editors are, quite frankly, unstinting in their, in their, in their work ethic and in their, in their willingness to engage with people uh, across a broad range um, of areas. Um, but we make mistakes, and we make mistakes often. Um, but I'd like to think that we uh, never make mistakes for malevolent reasons, that when we do so, it's through uh, an act of, of human human frailty. Um, but to deepen that uh, compact of trust that you know is the bedrock of all that we do it's important that we actually tell people when we've made mistakes and that we correct the record when we, when we make mistakes and quite frankly we apologize for when we've made really egregious errors that, uh, that have, an, have an impact on on, on things um, so perhaps in the framework of, um, of ethics and uh, and social responsibility I, I should touch on uh, some of the things that we have in terms of our corrections policy, which I think is an interesting, interesting one. Um, there is a managing editor who reports to me. Um, he, at the moment, um, fields all sorts of complaints uh, that come through to us by phone. Oh, and uh, congratulations as well. We don't just get complaints. <laughs> uh, we get the occasional bouquet. Um, he fields them, fields them on my behalf and determines whether or not that just needs a response from, from myself or from the appropriate section editor or journalist, uh, a phone call to, um, to clarify what may be a misunderstanding, maybe a worthy issue for a right of reply, although a right of reply is, is not something that anyone can and should have um, if if they're not actually furthering a point. And then you step through issues, whether it be a clarification, a correction, or an apology. Um, but I think that the masthead strength is improved by having a very open um, and understandable policy when it comes to this, rather than being diminished. 
some publishers fight vigorously against correcting the record. They see it as a sign of weakness, we at the Herald see it as a sign of strength. Now pausing there, I don't want all of page two to be a checkerboard of corrections and clarifications. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it is unrealistic to assume when formulating what the newspaper is lovingly called the daily miracle that nothing is ever going to go wrong. And as I said, when, we, when you amplify that consideration with the now myriad platforms that I'm also responsible for, the internet, the mobile phone, our tablet platform, our Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms upon which we dance. And interestingly, in a scoop that I can unfurl to this very gathering, uh, we will be one of the first publishers to be on the, uh, on the smartwatch. Uh, for what reason, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Other than to be there. <coughs> of course, uh, basically, we need to be on as quickly as they emerge, and if they don't uh, found an audience, well, then we can move on. But recent history has shown that we move you know, slowly at our peril. Um, there are lots and lots of other important layers that underpin the, uh, the ethics and the practice of journalism at the Sydney Morning Herald. cowboy outfit, although I readily accept that some journalistic practices that people are exposed to do undermine um, the reputation of our industry. Uh, I mean, I, someone quipped earlier, um, why didn't you opt for a jury trial uh, in the Joe Hockey versus Fairfax defamation case? The matter was heard before a judge alone. Of course, the argument went politicians have such a bad reputation these days. Ah, yes. But what about journalists' reputations? <laughs> and we could have done a runoff with perhaps that they use car salesmen as well. <laughs> but there is the, the, the media, entertainment and arts lines, the journalists' <laughs> union, has a very, very um, firm code of ethics that underpin all that we do. They range from trying to be fair and balanced in everything that journalists do, right through to issues of privacy, commercial considerations, and so on and so forth. So we adopt unapologetically that, that set of principles. The Press Council is a, <coughs> a body that the Herald and many other major publishers are members of. It's a self-regulatory body. Some may argue that it's not tough enough. Some publishers would argue that it's too tough. I would prefer, obviously, self-regulation to a more regulated environment. But in order for us to actually um, validate that proposal, we need to actually be paid more than just lip service to the self-regulatory regime. And there's been a bit of press about um, how responsive publishers should to that process. I think it's a strong process and I think that uh, a properly elected body of community members assessing the practice of journalism should be encouraged rather than discouraged because if you are practicing responsibly then you have nothing to fear. Um, perhaps that's a naive view but it's one I'm still ascribing to. Um, and then there's another area that I wanted to touch on see my friend Vic uh, death, although I've seen him in better condition than the way he's looking today. I just want to touch on it's one of education, which I think is something I'm very keen to sponsor inside the newsroom. Having said that, against the backdrop of a bewilderingly fast newsroom in a newsroom environment, um, we have fewer staff than we did you know, in our glory days at Fairfax when the rivers of gold pulsed through the corridors. Um, we're still in good shape, but the reality is we have more reporters. Their time is stretched and 
there are more products to serve. So against that backdrop, though, I still think it's very important that we have a lot more ongoing education in the newsroom, and that's really something that has suffered over the last three years of internal change. It's not an excuse, it's probably just an aspect of mitigation. Um, and it flowed from a very unfortunate incident that uh, Vic and I worked hard on, which was the publication of a cartoon last year that caused great offence to members of the Jewish community, which I accepted we needed to apologise for. And in the backwash of that rather um, distressing event, um, we worked hard to assess how we could improve our, uh, our checking mechanisms. Because, I mean, notwithstanding the power of words, the power of images and imagery is tenfold, particularly when it comes to still images, particularly when it comes to, to cartoons. And so with the Jewish Board of Deputies, um, we worked hard to address a number of these things, not least what was an under-appreciation among many of my senior editors of the of the heaviness of, uh, of, of anti-Semitic behaviour. And uh, I'm glad to say that that's been very successfully received by my senior editors. I see issues with uh, the Muslim faith as being particularly important as well, and people from all faiths and religions and all cultural backgrounds have been part of that ongoing education and awareness of the newsroom. Not just that, it's helped sponsor, I don't know if you know this yet, Dick, but it's helped sponsor a number of ongoing education formats for my senior editors on a range of what I call sort of nuanced areas where there's no black and white and there's no right and wrong. There's no issue when it comes to domestic violence and suicide and mental illness, our depiction of mental illness in, 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 in mass media publications is, is, is very important. And, and so on and so forth. So I'll challenge my senior editors to, to come up with a, an ongoing curriculum <laughs> to hopefully further strengthen the, um, the judgment and the knowledge base um, with which my, my, team, my team is equipped. Lastly, this has been, again, harking back to my earlier remarks, this is such a vast topic that I'm never going to be able to do even play justice to it. But the other thing that I'm increasingly confronted by is the issue of a uh, thing called the right to be forgotten. And this is a phenomenon that stems, well, it has crystallised in a European Court of Justice decision of, of last year, where um, a fellow won the right to have a Google reference to him, a Google story reference to him, obliterated from the internet. Google is a, a tenant at uh, Fairfax HQ in Piedmont. It's a classic tale of new media growing, while the old media like us shrinks. So we've been able to sublet some of our, our former space to them. Um, but we've become quite friendly with the good folk at, at Google. Uh, it's a really confronting area, this. My initial view as a publisher was, well, I wouldn't go down to the state library and cut out the 1965 page nine story. I wouldn't airbrush history like that. But I must say I'm getting a little bit more rounded in terms of my appreciation of these issues. And what we're talking about here is somebody who was probably 18 and you know, drank too much and did something stupid and it comes to haunt them for the rest of their life because as soon as their prospective employer taps in their name into the Google search engine, Rather than Darren Woodson being a fine upstanding you know, law graduate with 500 out of 500 in the HSC, it's Darren Woodson, the guy that got arrested for being in the, in the Hyde Park Fountain or something like that uh, for a big night out. So there's serious issues here where I have to contend with the, you know, the public's right to know my responsibility to ensure that everything we publish is known about, but also an individual that may be an organisation's right to be forgotten. It's really challenging stuff and I don't have a, um, a ready-made answer for it. Hopefully I've given you
insight snapshot into my world, but again, returning to my uh, earlier exhortation, we take our jobs really seriously. We need to. And we've got a massive audience and a massive heritage and tradition to acknowledge and respect. Um, and we are as open-minded as we possibly can be now to, uh, to feedback and ways to improve ourselves so that we can discharge the wonderful privilege that we have and that is to, to uh, serve the communities. So I might wind it up there and then get the very kind interrogator Peter Manning to listen to some questions or maybe I can do that or how does it work for me?